Hello, my name is Alfred Bielek, more commonly known as Al Bielek. Original family name is Edward Cameron. I have been involved in the Philadelphia Experiment, the Montauk Project, Time Travel, Alien Connections of the Montauk Project, and some other projects, all of which have been secret over the years, most of which have never been declassified. When I first became aware of my involvement with the Philadelphia Experiment in January 1988, I had no idea how extensive my use, shall we say, by the government has been, nor where my research would go. I have been involved in many radio presentations, over 50, such people as Art Bell, Mike Siegel, uh, Mr. Jarvis, and others and in terms of direct presentations before a live audience, over 50 around the world, extensively in the United States, in Europe, and in Australia. The subjects covered have been from the Philadelphia Experiment, the Montauk Project, mind control, some discussion of aliens, and related subjects. And they all fit together so that you, the viewer, may get some better idea of what information you have been, been denied by our government, been denied by the media, with a few exceptions, and give you a base of information so you can do your own research. Those of you who may be skeptical, because frankly the presentation is going to become rather bizarre as we go on with it, for those of you who are skeptical, I say fine. It is quite healthy to be skeptical. But go do your homework if you don't quite believe us, which is, as I say, quite healthy. Do your own homework, your own research, and I f feel confident that eventually you will understand that what we are presenting is the truth. But that is for you to decide. The purpose is to educate. The purpose is to get you to think. The purpose is to help you to understand things which you may have wondered about for years and which you have had only very sketchy information presented to you from other sources. We will go into the history of the Philadelphia Experiment, how it overlapped eventually into the Montauk Project, the people who were involved. Other presenters and myself will be such persons as <coughs> Preston Nichols, who was heavily involved in the Montauk Project, Mike uh, Stu Swerdlow, who was also involved in the Montauk Project, and connections with aliens, and they all interlap, overlap and interlock. Another man who was involved with the Montauk Project, Larry James, who, by the way, it is not his real name, but at his request, we will not use his real name. Many other people have been involved, but in many cases, we have not been able to get their consent to an interview. And, of course, many of the people involved in these projects in the past are now deceased or have, shall we say, vanished into the woodwork. As the case may be, we will go on and present to you as best we can the history as I know it and give you some food for thought. Many of these projects lasted many years. The Philadelphia Experiment, for example, did not begin in 1943, but began much earlier, 1931, and involved many people. A principal among them was, of course, Nikola Tesla, and there were many others. Many people have made contributions to many of these research projects. I was involved also during the war years, not only with the Philadelphia Experiment, but Los Alamos and the Atomic Bomb Project. I've been involved in many projects. <clears throat> there are other sources of information. There are many others who have published on something which they know about either the Philadelphia Experiment or the Montauk Project. Unfortunately, I'll have to say, some of this may prove and does prove to be disinformation. But you, the viewer, must decide. How do you separate out information from disinformation? That has been a classic question for a long time. It takes a lot of research. It takes a base of knowledge. You have to start someplace, continue to acquire knowledge and information on the subject, and as you do, eventually you will start to see a pattern. The pattern may emerge as disinformation. If it does, that's fine. You then throw away the disinformation, you continue, you will eventually come up with the true information. I'm not saying it's an easy process. It is not. I've had to do it myself. In the process of uncovering information and on my own memories, 
At first you come up with memories that you swear are true, but then you find that there's some distortion. You didn't remember exactly all the details. And it takes a great deal of time and a great deal of depth of research and going back time and again into your memories to find out what really happened. In order to correlate your own memories, you have to have other people who are involved at that time or have memories or information, hard information in some cases, of what occurred at that time. It takes a lot of work to eventually come up with a complete, or at least if not complete, a true story insofar as you know it. So that is what basically I'm presenting here, as well as the other presenters. The purpose is to educate you as to what has happened, what has been covered up, where the government has deliberately covered up information, covered up complete reports, covered up complete ex experiments, a complete history such as the Philadelphia experiment, the Montauk project relatively few people have heard of, yet the site still exists on the eastern tip of Long Island and you can go out there personally and view what's left of the buildings. Today they are in the process of being torn down, but one year ago they were almost all there. Hard research does show a lot of hardware and a lot of uh, artifacts, if you will, which support the evidence we will present. And quite aside from the movie, The Philadelphia Experiment, which was close to the truth of what happened, but of course, not blaming Hollywood, they have to present a story, and of course it was embellished with a typical Hollywood love story and other aspects which did not quite fit the facts. But for those of you who have not seen The Philadelphia Experiment, the movie, it is out there, both in CD and in the older form VHS video. If you've not seen the commercial movie, it I suggest it's worth seeing. It doesn't give you the whole truth, but it gives you an insight. And as you progress through what I have to say and others have to say, you will eventually learn that those who did the movie definitely knew, the, at least to some extent, the facts of what happened. Doing this and viewing other things in terms of other presenters you will eventually come to an understanding of the real history, which I might add is not easy. It's April 16, 1992, and this will be the second underground interview with Al Bilek, uh, coming to you directly from the American Academy of Dissident Sciences. Al, would you summarize for our viewers very briefly for these that have not seen your first underground tape uh, what was the Philadelphia experiment and what was your part in it because all of our discussion in this second interview would be about what happened later and about some other uh, projects that basically have not been commented uh, about so far Okay, very briefly, the Philadelphia Experiment was a project undertaken by the Navy during the war years, which had its early and original genesis in 1931 in Chicago, was moved to the Institute of Advanced Studies in 1934 in Princeton, New Jersey. And by 1940, they had a functional test which proved they could produce invisibility on a Navy ship. That was Rainbow One. They classified it and made it a project called Project Rainbow. In March of 42, with Nikola Tesla having been the director since 34, he was to have a test of invisibility on a battleship. He deliberately sabotaged it because he refused to be responsible for the loss of life, which he expected due to the extremely high electromagnetic power and energies involved to produce the invisibility effect. So the Neumann took over, and in 1943, after a lot of preparation in late, mid to late 42 and in 43, they held the first test in July 22nd, 43, which was fully successful. The ship became invisible to radar as well as to the site and to a camera. But they had some personnel problems, not super bad, but nevertheless, those on deck were nauseous and ill and had to be removed after the ship returned to dock. The final test was 12 August 1943, and that one was a total disaster. Uh, 
after it disappeared and then remained in hyperspace for some four hours by linear measured time in 1943. It returned, and there were some crew members missing, others on fire. Mind all those on deck were crazy, insane, except myself, who had just come back. As the field started to dissipate, we found, of course, four men buried in steel as we went out on deck again, and a fifth man with his hand on a steel bulkhead, and a lot of other insanity all over the place, everyone running around totally in gibberish, insane. Some of the guys were burning, some were disappearing and reappearing, and it was a total disaster. And uh, from that point on, the Navy, after one more aborted test late in October, washed their hands of the entire thing and scrapped the project and sent the Elbridge to sea as a regular destroyer after re-outfitting it. Now, the project was dropped in 43 due to the very bad and disastrous results. And in 47, it was uh, taken up again at the request of the Navy. Dr. von Neumann was asked to look into it and see if he could find out what really went wrong and if anything could be salvaged. He did find what went wrong, and since he was already working on a computer design from 1946 at the Institute of Advanced Study, he continued his work. The computer designs were completed in 1952. The first model was built. The second one went to England, and I think the third went to the Navy Department. And in 1953, with a totally new design, having been working on several projects simultaneously, they had a final test with the Navy in a totally new project in which there was no personnel interaction. They had full invisibility radar and optical, and everybody was happy because there was no problem. So then we classified the project again and called it Project Phoenix. And that name, code name, Project Phoenix, became the genesis and the coverall for a multitude of sins and a multitude of projects which the government shoveled under that umbrella. They had everything from uh, mind control projects to invisibility project that is a continuation of the Philadelphia experiment to time uh, travel problems and time travel systems and time tunnels and, and uh, attempts at uh, crossbreeding humans with reptilians and a few other little strange things all came under that umbrella. So that is very basically and very quickly what happened with the Philadelphia project. Now, if you want to get into some of the other commentaries, many of the things which have come to light in the last few years have made this entire operation called Project Phoenix and the carry-on of the Philadelphia experiment, also Project Phoenix now, more than a little bit bizarre. When they perfected, that is, when they made a working experiment that was without hitch, without glitch, and without problems for personnel, of course, the project became of great interest to the Navy and to other military services. After several generations of revamping, they finally came up with what is today commonly called the stealth technology. Now, the stealth technology basically involves not only... The, the real stealth technology. Yes, it involves not only special coatings placed on the stealth fighter and the stealth bomber, but also the full invisibility technology, which is on the B-1 bomber, has been for many years, the B-2. On Navy, every Navy fighter aircraft in the fleet, on every fighter aircraft the Israelis have, on a number of other Air Force craft, all of the super carriers. And this technology is now reduced to the uh, portable size where an individual can be made invisible. So it's gone through many generations of uh, revamping and shrinking of the size of the equipment which says two things. One, solid-state technology has become of age, and you are now able to do in a very small package things that it once took a huge a pile of equipment to do. Secondly, they've modified the equipment to some extent so that it is now possible to make it portable and still completely effective. What the principles now are that they're using, I don't know. I don't know if it bears a resemblance to the original procedures or not, but they do have it working. So this now can be done by either one of two techniques. One, hardware, or the second one, I understand, is they can put the human, that is a Secret Service man, through a special processing where without hardware he becomes invisible for about 72 hours. 
and then he starts to do the invisible man number and start to come back into visibility and also begins to uh, understand violently ill when in the process of coming back to quote normalcy unquote either way they have control over processes of, of invisibility invisible hangover. you might have a very powerful invisible hangover and the hangover is not invisible to the peer, the person who has to withstand it this is only one of the aspects of many things which have occurred. One very interesting thing here that comes to my attention is that if all carriers and if all planes are equipped with this invisibility, which basically is also a teleportation technique, then uh, practically all confrontation on this planet become impossible because you cannot fight a fleet that can hop around the world oceans at will, just flipping the numbers flipping the dials and showing up somewhere else yeah. after turning on the invisibility there's more than one report of this of a fleet going invisible in the pacific off radar off optical view by private aircraft that happen to be flying in the area and the fleet shows up a day later so a couple of thousand miles away and uh, steaming and under completely normal conditions where it doesn't appear like anything has happened just so they've changed location in the meantime, and they were totally off all radar, were not visible, and could not be tracked in that period of time. They made a quick jump of some type, and were there. How they explain this to the sailors, I don't know. How they explain to the personnel on board the ship that are not in on the equipment, because these big carriers and larger ships, everybody does not know about the equipment, only a handful of personnel, including the skipper, of course. So basically, it. I mean, all these things show that if these things are real, that the, uh, the whole Cold War has been a very clever Mickey Mouse game between the two superpowers in order to siphon tremendous amount of funding into these black projects. Because technically, I mean, both superpowers are armed with, armed with these uh, uh, advanced technologies. You cannot literally fight the war or you can destroy the whole planet. But my, my, my important point is, well, well, what do you think about the, um, well, the recent revelations from so many places that basically this whole war has been a very clever arrangement in the, between the, super, the two superpowers that have been transferring technology behind the scenes. Are you referring to World War II? Or, and um, after that. Not after. after. Insofar as, insofar as World War II is concerned, I would say yes. There was a great deal of covert transfer of technology, not just before, but during the war. Before the war, it was not covert. During the war, it was covert. And then after the war, of course, we seized everything because Nazi Germany surrendered. Uh, that is, the Nazi group surrendered Germany. They did not surrender, period. The Nazis never surrendered, which is one of the best-kept secrets of history. They merely moved out of Germany and went to Antarctica and took all their best projects and hardware with them. But insofar as the covert technology transfer is concerned, there's a great deal of evidence that there was a continuing covert transfer of personnel. My father was in on some of this uh, smuggling of people out of Germany to the U.S. during prior to and during the early part of World War II. And with it, some of the technology, because the Germans developed their own time. 1945. We developed the equivalent of it with the Philadelphia experiment in 43 and an actual one in 44. Late. These two projects have been secretly coordinated from a higher level so that to compare notes and to see which one would do it better. That would be true except for the fact that Germans had no invisibility project. Uh, there's no evidence they had one of any kind but there is some partial evidence to the effect that there may have been an attempt by a Nazi sympathizer to steal the Eldridge in the final test and take it out to sea and turn it over to the Germans. And yes, there was definitely covert cooperation at military levels, which the public didn't know about and most of the military didn't know about. We also have the fine example of the Germans developing jet aircraft in 1939, operational, and they had uh, jet fighter aircraft and two engine fighter craft and jet bombers and by 1941-42 and, and, and rockets by, and by 43 which were ready to go on production in 41 and this was before the British ever heard about a jet engine in fact they only heard about it because the Germans were building them and they probably captured one 
And at that point, they tried to replicate it. They couldn't. They went to a different design, which was grossly inferior to the British design. That was changed much later. But they did not have the correct design. The Americans, I understand, did proceed with the design very much according to the original German designs. Guess where did they get the drawings? I couldn't imagine. Uh, much of this sort of thing went on. Talking about nuclear bombs, I was very interested when you mentioned that there are persistent rumors and even uh, comments by some major physicists, Oppenheimer included, that uh, the two devices that were exploded over Japan were actually of German uh, origin, of German production. This was alluded to by a German who was writing or connected with the book that was published in Toronto, Canada, outlining the history of the UFO development in Germany and also making some passing reference to the nuclear program which Germany had ongoing during World War II. And it was known, it was found out after the war was over, it was known that the Germans had developed and had built a number of atomic bombs which were in their arsenal and apparently never used. And they were working on a super bomb of a totally unknown design which they were going to plan to use on New York or London, probably New York, London, or New York, whichever they chose to wipe out first, which according to the reports, a single bomb about the size of a pineapple was sufficient to wipe out the entire city, which is to say it was more powerful than the hydrogen bombs which were yet to be invented. But this would easily be a, an anti-matter bomb. Very possibly. That's about the only thing that would do it. The German technology was so far advanced beyond ours, it's unbelievable, and it's unbelievable that they lost the war, but they did. And perhaps uh, better for all of us that that did happen.